Court rise. on the application of Sharon and Telerisco and others and the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. My Lords, my Lady Brown and Mr Donnelly for the Secretary of State, Mr Drabble, Queen's Councillor, Mr Royston for the respondents. Yes, uh, can I start by saying I'm sorry we're a little bit late, but I think we will, we've read it carefully. Once you understand the issue, this case is not going to run us up to the wire. No, my Lord. Um, my Lord, just in terms of protocol, uh, we understand that because we're socially distanced, we are not required to wear a mask. But that is correct. Um, uh, I think anyone with a speaking role uh, needn't wear a mask, um, even if they're not speaking at the time. I think it's thought to be better practice for those without speaking roles to continue to wear masks, although, well, I, I, frankly, I don't know what the rules are either. But I think unless people feel uncomfortable doing so, I think it's better if they do. I don't but I won't be being a policeman about it because you're all socially distanced. Thank you. Um, in terms of housekeeping, my Lord's indicated that we have a fairly short set of documents. We have a core bundle, a uh, supplemental bundle containing the core evidence, and we have a fairly modest authority bundle. Yes. Um, my Lord, what I propose to do, subject to the court's direction, is to set out some preliminary observations about the Secretary of State's case. Um, I then propose to break down my submissions essentially into three parts. I propose to take the court to the statutory purpose and the statute that requires me to take the court to the evidence that was before the judge below, which sets out broad themes in respect of the social security legislation in yeah. question, and also specific points, and I anticipate that much of that material will not be unfamiliar to the court, but there are certain points of emphasis which may well be useful. Um, Having shown the court then the statute, I propose then to take the court to Johnson, which of course will be familiar to my Lord and no doubt to the court in general. And Johnson, we say, is important in two respects. First, the, the observations of the Court of Appeal in general terms about the Universal Credit Scheme and what the relevant statutory purpose is as identified by the court. And also, more widely, the test for irrationality that was established by the court in Johnson. Uh, thirdly, I, I propose to take the court then through what we say are the errors in the judge's reasoning below and why we say the appeal should be allowed. Um, my Lord, the appeal then concerns the proper interpretation of the Universal Credit Regulations 2013. And if I can just show you the court's order below, which encapsulates the issue. Um, so that is core bundle, please, tab 9. Page 65 of the bundle, um, the judge, paragraph 1, allowed the application for judicial review and the relevant declaration in paragraph 2 provides as follows. It is declared that the calculation required by regulation 821A, read together with regulation 54 of the Universal Credit Regulations 2013, is irrational and unlawful insofar as employees who are paid on a four-weekly basis, as opposed to a calendar monthly basis, are treated as having earned income of only 28 days earnings in 11 out of 12 assessment periods a year. So that's the issue. Um, we'll look at the legislation very shortly, but in terms of those two regulations, the court will appreciate that Regulation 82 is a statutory formula for determining the financial amount that needs to be earned in an assessment period. And Regulation 54 is the general rule as it's described on its face, and which was considered by this court in Johnson, uh, that general rule being that earnings are calculated for the assessment period in which they are, in fact, received. And there is, in general terms, no process of reattribution of earnings into other assessment periods. Um, so the court will appreciate that the 2013 regulations provide the relevant architecture for the administration of universal credit, which is now in operation across the country. The wider context of the declaration that I've shown the court is that where the money received by reference to Regulation 54 is lower than the minimum amount which Parliament has considered necessary to trigger disapplication of the benefit cap, the court has determined that that state of affairs is irrational. 
Um, the important point, one of the main focuses of my submissions, will be the significance and the relevance of the monthly paradigm, which we say is at the heart of universal credit and this appeal. So the monthly paradigm is contained in the formula, which I'll show the court shortly. Essentially, one multiplies by 52 over 12 in order to convert earnings into a monthly amount. It is right to note that this could have been done weekly. It could have been done annually, noting that the benefit cap itself is expressed as an annual amount. But as the evidence shows, a decision was taken to adopt a monthly paradigm. We say for good reason. And that decision having been taken, the monthly paradigm then sits at the heart of the universal credit structure. So our submission, which I make at the outset, is that this is really quite different from Johnson. Because here, the Secretary of State, having opted for a monthly paradigm, is not here concerned with a, a fine-tuning situation. So the issue before the Court of Appeal in Johnson was, well, you, Secretary of State, have decided to adopt a monthly payment paradigm as the basis for your scheme. This situation sits within that monthly paradigm. And it's irrational for you not to fine tune to take account of something which is, uh, which is um, predictable, no fault of the employee, etc. And we'll look at the reasons that the Court of Appeal gave in Johnson for its decision. But that's Johnson. This case, and indeed all other regular payment cycles which are not the monthly paradigm, sit outside the structure that the Secretary of State has elected. So we say that that is a fundamental point of distinction because the Secretary of State, at an early stage, set her face against accommodating different paradigms, i.e. 28-day payment cycles, fortnightly payment cycles, weekly payment cycles, any other payment cycle. You mentioned a good reason for the paradigm of a month. Can you just encapsulate what the good reason is? reason was. Yes, absolutely, and I'll, I'll show you the, court, the, the evidence, but um, the statistics show that it's the most common form of payment cycle in the, in the labour market at the moment, so that's the primary reason. Calendar monthly is the most common. Calendar monthly, mm -hmm. yes. So the word lunar monthly is it's a slightly difficult terminology, because what would never see it in an Convenient, but slightly inaccurate. Yes. Well, it's not inaccurate, it just suggests that it's got something to do with the lunar month. Indeed. Yeah, I did month. look last night and it didn't make any sense to me in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one understands the point, but um, certainly in an employment contract, one would expect to see it as a 28-day payment cycle as opposed to you are paid on a lunar month cycle, but I, I don't think it makes any particular difference. But in answer to my, my Lord's question, certainly the evidence shows that not only is it the most common payment cycle, but also the trend is moving away from other payment cycles towards a monthly paradigm. So the direction of travel is very firmly towards monthly payments. Um, both in public and private sector employment. But also, and it's an important point that's um, set out in the evidence, it also reflects outgoings as well as incomings. So bills typically will be structured on a, a monthly cycle, be it rent, utilities, and indeed all other outgoings. And so the Secretary of State's view is that by encapsulating all of, this, all of these budgetary considerations into a single monthly paradigm, that does facilitate and, and enable people to budget more effectively. It's a, a macro decision. There will be instances, and I emphasize this, we accept that, there will be instances where uh, people, people's particular circumstances are such that they don't fall within the paradigm. And that, in fact, the, the, the general uh, proposition that budgeting is easier may not, in fact, be true in the fact of an individual case. But as a general, um, as a general objective, that's the reason. Um, the, the court, it is right to note, did record, and this is at paragraph 43 of its judgment, which is at page 80 of the bundle, that the same considerations and the same logic of its approach would apply to anyone who is paid on a weekly or fortnightly pay cycle. So we are not just concerned with a particular specific situation facing this particular respondent. We are talking about everybody. 
who is on a different regular payment cycle. The most obvious are weekly or fortnightly, or 28 days, but indeed it could be anything. Because, uh, as again, I'll, I'll show the court very shortly, the cohort that we are concerned with is a cohort of individuals um, in typical work, in atypical work, and the species of atypical work are very wide and very diverse. In yeah, well, hang on. Surely this particular form of the problem, I quite agree, except applies to weekly and fortnightly paid people. But we are concerned only with people paid what you might call regularly. People with irregular payments is a quite different, different problem. Yes. And one which it is easier for the Secretary of State to defend. And clearly, the Secretary of State thought a lot about it, people with irregular payments and said, "No, we must, uh, we must um, focus on actual receipts, and not a portion or yes. average." Um, uh, but they are really they're not what we're concerned with. We're concerned with people paid regularly, but otherwise than calendar monthly. And realistically, that just means multiples of a week. I've never heard of people paid every five days, or the theory they could occur. I no, but it's not inconceivable that one could have uh, somebody paid regularly but seasonally. So somebody who's, for example, paid only in May. Oh, months. I see. Yes, uh, I was using regular to cover two different ph phenomena: both the pattern of payment and the pattern of work. Yes, um, and one could also have regular, for example, term time employment. Um, and it's possible then there would be a degree of regularity which isn't necessarily a, yes, I see. a, a cycle as such but is paid by reference when the person is in fact working. So there are several different permutations that one can quite easily conceive of and which the department has conceived of which all need to be considered for the purpose of this scheme. So um, we say that the, the paradigm and the consequences of the paradigm were obvious to the scheme's architects from the outset. And indeed, it is common ground between the parties that the Secretary of State knew that there would be consequences for electing a particular monthly paradigm. So you see the respondent skeleton at paragraph 37, which is at page 26 of the fourth bundle. Which, par which paragraph do you say? Uh, 37, please. Does um, my lord have that page? Yeah. So the respondents fairly accept that the Secretary said understood in advance of the regulations being made the effects of the earned income calculation on calculations of the appropriate means related deduction to make from UC awards. She recognised that her money received method would create for people paid on four weekly patterns oscillations in UC awards from one assessment period to another. And then paragraph 38 makes the point that that causes budgeting problems. We'll come on to that. But here again, please note this is quite different from Johnson because this is in fact the same payment 11 months out of 12 and then a very different one in month 12. But it isn't the Johnson situation where three, possibly four times a year in a way which is only predictable with a fairly complicated calendar-based calculation, one sees the sudden sharp drop. Here, one sees, in fact, the same amount payable, 11 months out of 12. It's also a feature of the scheme itself rather than some external happening. Yes, indeed. It, it is a feature of the scheme. Absolutely so, my lady. Well, can I just ask that this part of our skeleton is contrasting the point made in 37 realisation that there are consequences of oscillation and the point made in 39, not realising at all the impact on the benefit cap calculation. <laughs> uh, I'll certainly let, obviously, the respondents make their point on that. We, we don't accept the submission that it was never appreciated that one of the many consequences of there being this particular monthly paradigm is that it wasn't un understood. I, I'm bound to say this is slightly a debating point. I remember we had it in Johnson, and my recollection of yours will be better than mine. I, I should have rechecked it, the judgment, but my recollection is that it was a bit equivocal, the evidence about whether the Secretary of State actually had appreciated that there was a banking, non banking day shift problem. Yes. I think.
think the evidence was that somebody somewhere in the department had noticed it, but it's not clear if it ever went into the policy making. But anyway, it really ultimately doesn't matter very much. The crucial question is, as I understand it from one of your submissions, is that this was fundamental to the structure which was adopted as part of the philosophy of the legislation. To say that it was irrational because it had this consequence would be very different from saying that the failure to deal with the blip, rather particular kind of blip, in Johnson was irrational. And that would be so, really, whatever the history of the decision-making process is. It's a debating point for you if you can show the Secretary of State thought about it and reach a considered decision, because that makes it constitutionally more difficult for us to say that they were wrong. Um, but ultimately, it's got to depend on objective rationality, hasn't it? Yes, absolutely. So I, I, I don't disagree with any of that at all. Um, so uh, I suppose the, where it becomes a debating point is that the respondents say, well, you didn't use the words benefit cap in your decision-making process. So that demonstrates that you haven't appreciated the Ms. Pantelerisco consequence. Yeah. I mean, the debating point the other way is that if you didn't think about it, well, perhaps it's the, uh, that just shows it was overlooked and can easily be put right. But well, uh, could potentially be put right. Yes, all right, um, separate points. But you didn't think, yes. Yes, I mean, uh, here, um, did the Secretary of State carefully consider the, the fundamental issue, which is to adopt a paradigm which is going to work, uh, or it's going to be congruent with monthly payment cycles and monthly outgoings, but not congruent with other payment cycles? Yes, she plainly did. That's at yeah. the heart of everything. So that is really what drives all of this. And that's why I started with the court's order below to make it absolutely clear that this case, unlike Johnson, is a challenge to an, a decision which was at the forefront of the scheme design. Um, and it is no answer for the respondents to say, well, don't worry, because what we really mean is you just disapply the benefit cap or something like that. Because the answer to that is, well, Parliament's decided how the benefit cap should apply. It's a fixed amount of money receivable in an assessment period, not 16 hours a week of work or anything like that. So it's simply not open for the respondents to say, well, we don't meet the minimum um, income amount, but you should just disapply anyway, because that then runs contrary to another uh, decision that's been made, one made by Parliament, which is to fix the benefit cap at a certain level, and it's a financial level. We'll, we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, just then to make good the points about the, the centrality of uh, assessment periods and the monthly paradigm, I propose then just to deal with the statutory purpose and the legislation itself. Um, so just to clear the decks, it is common ground in this appeal that the benefit cap, of course, is lawful and applies in the way that Parliament has prescribed in the legislation. And certainly a point that was pursued below, perhaps not on appeal, uh, was to look back at the earlier iteration of the benefit cap and say, well, one can see from the earlier version that Parliament had in mind that if somebody works 16 hours per week, as this claimant does, the benefit cap should not apply to that person. That's, that's fine as far as it goes, but that's the old policy. That's been superseded, and the legislation doesn't provide for that anymore. You have to receive the minimum income amount in the assessment period. Uh, and that, that, we say, is for good reason when one understands the structure of universal credit as opposed to legacy benefits. Um, so the new policy then is income received. There is no direction as to how that income should be received. So it can be one job, multiple jobs, combination of employment and self-employment, part-time work along alongside full-time work, any of those aspects um, would be catered for by the same system. Um, so, in terms then of the, the evidence, if I can just ask the court, please, to take up the supplemental bundle. I propose to start with Ms. Crappe's evidence and show you the after Ms. Hargreaves, and that's all I propose to show you in terms of statutory purpose. Um, bear in mind that this evidence was also directed to what was originally ground one of the challenge below, which was the payment allegation, so the, the Johnson Divisional Court point, which is no longer live between the parties. 
Um, so the evidence comes from the Universal Credit Policy Team leader. The witness sets out from paragraph five the background to universal credit and makes the point of paragraph six that the regulations with which the court is concerned were passed by affirmative resolution. So, so where, 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 which paragraph did you say? That was paragraph six. So it's at the top of page three. Yeah. Not proposing to take the court through all of the detailed social, social policy history of universal credit. It's summarized by this court in Johnson. Um, so picking up these though at paragraph 11 of the evidence. The point I emphasize is that the policy of court is looking to further multiple overlapping objectives. So it aims to better incentivize work. It aims to reduce complexity. It aims to better interact social security with the labor market. Those are certainly primary policy objectives. But it is right to note that they are sometimes in conflict with each other. And that is inevitable when one is considering a large social policy reform. So sometimes a particular feature will be driven more towards workability and efficiency rather than the promotion of work. And one of the criticisms that I will make of the judgment is that, insofar as the judge says, oh, well, it doesn't incentivize work in this particular instance, that may or may not be right. In fact, we say it's not right. But that's not the objective. We're not saying that the scheme will inevitably incentivize work for every single person. You, you say it's driving behaviors it is. across a spectrum. Yes, it's, it's driving behaviours. That is fundamental. And that means behaviours not just of individuals, but also to some extent employers. So it's restructuring the labour market to some extent. Um, but also, it has to be administratively efficient in order to deliver these benefits. So it's not just efficiency because that's convenient and costs less. But in, actual, in order to make the system work, it needs to be efficient and capable of operation by DWP using automated systems. And it needs to be easily understandable by the cohort, by individuals who claim universal credit. These are critical considerations. And every layer of complexity that one brings in, whether it's through choice or by compulsion, inevitably increases the complexity of the scheme. Some of that is desirable. Some of that is not desirable. We say that this particular uh, order of compulsion is not desirable. Um, so th the point I've made about simplicity in the system is, is made at paragraph 14. Then paragraph 15 uh, summarizes then the policy objectives. To repeat, some intention with each other in some circumstances. Then, paragraph 17 how, in the Secretary of State's view, does one achieve all of these objectives? Well, at the uh, heart of everything is the, the proposition that uh, the calculation is based upon earnings in the assessment period. So, paragraph 17 makes the point that. That allows for the dynamic response to changes in circumstances. Because if one's income is reduced by reference to a monthly paradigm, that allows for universal credit to increase immediately in response to all of that. And that's earnings received, not earnings earned. Um, earnings received, yes. So it's, it's money received. Come in. Usually, it's the same thing. We, well, it's a debate we had in Johnson about what earnings means and apportionment and things like that. But um, it, it, it is earnings received. Um, then, paragraph 20, monthly assessment periods. Here, the witness then sets out the Secretary of State's response to the, the particular point. So noting that this concerns four weekly pay cycles, and the witness says in paragraph 21, the calculation of UC in each monthly assessment period is a cornerstone of UC policy. All changes that occur in the assessment period are applied to the whole assessment period, 
and each policy consideration is looked at across the assessment period, such as inclusion of disability elements, child elements, child care, carers elements, conditionality arrangements, treatment of income, capital deductions, etc. In paragraph 22, the assessment period is calculated as a calendar month. A calendar month, the basis is used as is considered to best reflect the most common payment cycles, whether in terms of income, such as salary, or outgoing, such as bill payments. In paragraph 23, the objective of workability and efficiency requires the same structure to operate for the whole population, notwithstanding that there are, of course, different types of payment cycles, such as irregular pay or weekly or lunar monthly pay. And I, I take my Lord's point that, in one sense, irregular pay is not properly described as a, as a cycle. But one sees the point that the witness is making. That this has to capture everything. So here, the priority is workability and efficiency. See paragraph 23 in terms of the overall objectives. And then paragraph 24, we say that makes clear that the Secretary's judgment is underpinned by logic and by an evaluation from specialists within the department about conditions in society and the labour market. And that is where the relevant expertise rests. The Department of Work and Pensions is a labour market specialist. It understood and understands and has access to the relevant data which informs all of these judgments. So a rather pay. random question. Who is the current Secretary of State? Uh, Therese Pepe. And the, the points then that are made by the witness are the points that I've already indicated. So monthly payments are the norm. Paradigm assist with budgeting in the Secretary of State specialist view. And this does then cater for diverse employment arrangements and indicated some of the concerns, but just to highlight the, the concerns that face the department in light of this particular judgment, um, one could even conceivably have somebody who is working, for example, uh, term time and also working on a 28-day payment cycle at the same time. So two different sources of income. The current system, as we say, is it should be applied, deals with all of that. Sorry, I don't, this isn't an example. Is this an example of your skeleton? No. Um, no it doesn't matter, but I'm just trying to understand it. because you. So you're saying the situation of someone who is working a 28-day cycle or paid on a 28-day cycle. Let, let's take an easy case. So somebody who is working in continuous permanent employment but paid on a 28-day cycle, for example. But say, for example, that person is only receiving the national living wage for eight hours a week. So they would not be at the level required to disapply the benefit cap. That person could also, at the same time, have another job and to take a, a simple example, let's just say that's another job also for eight hours a week, but on a monthly payment cycle, so leave aside term time working. Um, so then, what does the system do in response to that? So we know that part of the income is being received in a cycle which is 28 days, part of the income is being received in a cycle that is monthly. The judge appears to have said, well, if we look at the evidence in relation to the RTI feed, you can identify that there is a 28-day field in respect of all of that. But that doesn't tell you enough in order to understand what the intention or what the purpose of the scheme should be for that sort of received income. It's throwing up a problem, but not any sensible solution to it. Because it's, it's, you have a straightforward case, the Spencer Lewis case, case, where it's 28 days for somebody in regular continuous employment over, for example, a year. But as soon as one starts changing the, that paradigm, even with very modest amendments, then it just becomes unworkable immediately. It's entirely unclear from the court's judgment how one caters to the sort of regular alternative employment that I've just set out. Sorry, again, just picking up on a minor point, but she did actually give me pause. You talk about the national living wage. Yes. But I, th and then that is referred to in somewhere the judgment or the skeleton of Ms. Pantelerisco is on that, but um, the rules are only concerned with the national minimum wage. 
the, 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 it's the national living wage that one needs um, that forms the basis then of uh, benefit cap. I'm sorry, I'm obviously being, this is obviously ignorant of me or out of date of me. There was a time, just tell me where I've gone wrong. There is the national minimum wage under now the National Minimum Wage Regulations 2015, I thought. The national living wage was a different non-statutory concept, which I wasn't aware has been um, given any statutory force. Have I got that wrong? Am I yes, it's moved on slightly from that. Um, my Lord's absolutely right. When, when the regulations came in 98, it, there was a, a single rate for over 18s only, I think, uh, possibly a, a lower rate for under 18s, or, but possibly that came in later. The position as it is now is that um, if one is over 23, then one is entitled to the national living wage. Which I'm, is so, I'm so sorry. That's just it's just it's just I'm out of date, and I didn't check all this as I thought I knew it. But, but I didn't. 82 1A refers to the NMW regulations, not to the national. Living yes. Wage. The, so um, the, the national living wage. My was absolutely right. It, before it was a uh, it was an aspiration, and it is now statutory, and it, it is. Well, what? How did it, how, is that in our? Is, is, is it? If I looked through our authorities, I'd find that. Would I? Can you, I, I don't think we've got the, the minimum wage regulations in here. It's in the national minimum wage regulations because those regulations are still the provisions which establish all minimum pay um, regulations. But if I can just tell you the structure, yeah. then I'll explain how it works in terms of the statute, and then how it works in terms of the social security aspect. So, as matters stand now. If one is over 23, one is entitled to £8.91 per hour. This, these are today's rates, as opposed to... Did you say 821? £8.91. £8 so it was 821, now yes. it's 8 .91. Don't worry about now. <laughs> I think it's confusing enough. Let's stick with the time with which this claim is concerned. Happy to do that. All I'm really trying to do is just explain what the different um, uh, uh, minimum wages are, because there, are more, there is now more than one. Yes, okay. The national living wage is the one that over 23s are entitled to. So is this another way of putting it? Under the national minimum wage regulations, still so called, either as amended since 2015 or perhaps reissued in full, I don't know, um, there are two creatures. There is the national minimum wage, which you get if you're under 23, and the national living wage, which you get if you're over 23. Is that right, or is it not as simple as that? There were four, but yes, it is as simple as that. Of the other two, just for curiosity. Under 18s and apprentices. I see, but they all get, ver ver they all get the national minimum wage, but at different rates. Yes. When you get to 23, you get the national living wage, which is more than any of the versions of the national minimum wage. Yes, precisely so, my lord. Well, I think it would be helpful just so that we don't make a mistake in our um, judgments, just to have a one-page note. Uh, uh, we don't even need to see the regs, as long as you agree it, but just showing us uh, where the regs are, because the last time I looked at the national minimum wage was, obviously, as you can tell, a few years ago, and this refinement was new to me. Yes, I think the refinement is... Uh believe terminology because I think even at the earliest stages there was always a higher minimum wage for people over a certain age but I think that's been moved a bit along the way. So it's literally just, uh, are you sure about that? It doesn't matter. But anyway, the national living wage is now not just a political concept, right. it is a statutory concept. Well, there you are. Now. Yes. No, I'm sorry. Um, Sorry, we took you out of your no, course, but that was not. Not at all. I um, was still on the the evidence. Uh, I was at paragraph twenty four, centrality of the calendar <coughs> month construct in the scheme. And then, uh, my, my lord may say it's not hugely central to all of this, but it's right to note that the responsible minister did uh, deal with this in Parliament. Uh, as set out of paragraph 26. So the centrality of assessment periods and a monthly payment cycle was part of the parliamentary debate. Does the... The Act doesn't specify a monthly assessment period, does it? It merely specifies assessment periods. No, and then do. the regs say they're to be monthly. 
Um, I, I could be, that's a question, let me yes. come out as a statement. I will check. Uh, I'll check whether the, that provision is in the Act or the regulation. Well, shall we look now? It's, it's, in a way, it's, again, it's just important for clear thinking of exactly what what we're dealing with as a matter of ministerial judgment and what we're dealing with as a matter of... Yes, I mean, the, the Court will appreciate that. I don't think anyone is suggesting that the decision to base the structure on a monthly assessment period is at all objectionable. Indeed, it seems to be common ground that that's a well-founded basis to proceed. Well, I see that, but uh, um, I would still want to feel firm ground under my feet as to what's in the statute and what's in the race. Well, of course, my Lord, and that certainly wasn't suggesting... I'm afraid I, all, all I've done is I've looked at the bits that were quoted in the skeleton. Yes. So I haven't marked up the actual... Uh, is, it, is it section 7? Yes, 7 and 8. 7 says universal credit is payable in respect of each complete assessment period, and assessment period is a period of, of a prescribed duration. So and somewhere is no doubt a power to the uh, regulations 3A73 73 actually doesn't say give the power to prescribe a duration but that's presumably found somewhere else 72 does oh. uh, yes yeah. but 72 says yes. it's a period of a prescribed duration and there must somewhere be a provision saying the Secretary of State has power to prescribe durations that's what I'm that's guessing yeah um Certainly, I had all of this at my fingertips for Johnson, and now it. I know. We're just just um, here to make life difficult. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, here we are. It, it is um, Regulation Twenty One One, which is at page two two eight behind tab uh, fourteen. Yes. So I think I'm with not patting myself on the back. But I think I'm right, aren't I? Yes. The Act left it open. Whatever the minister may have said in Parliament. Which was uh, that the passages you're referring to are uh, the bill, and I dare say he, they always knew what the regs were going to say, <clears throat> but actually the bill didn't commit them. The, the bill which became the act didn't commit them to monthly assessment period. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So all, all of the <coughs> actual architecture of universal credit is contained in the regulations. And lastly, your junior will do this if you're under your fingertips. Um, can you just give us the reference for? Where is the power to prescribe the duration of an assessment period? I'm sure there is one, but I mean, I'd just like to be able to. I thought that was section seven, but perhaps I. Well, that's well. Maybe I'm wrong. You, you're, my lady also thought that. Seven maybe. Yeah. As a matter of drafting, I would have thought a period of a prescribed duration required someone to have power to prescribe a duration. But maybe, maybe, you, maybe that's oh. implicit. It's common, I haven't checked it with this statute, but it's common in social security legislation to find a definition of prescribed. It means prescribed in regulation. Right. Yes, that's, what I, that's really what I... don't find a separate... That's rather what I was I, I haven't expecting, I thank you, you put it more accurately than me, but that's what I was looking for, and, and it's mm -hmm. either one way or another, I'm sure it's fine. I would just like to be able to... Yes. Uh, um, ...write it down correctly. Yes. Messages are popping up on the WhatsApp. Um, but we'll perhaps take a, uh, do it in a more considered fashion. That's okay. fine. Thank you. Um, okay. But the, sorry, we got into this because you were showing the minister saying what the bill said, and I was just being pernickety and saying that actually this isn't in the bill; it's only in the regs. But, yes. But um, my lord's absolutely right. Obviously, when one's designing a scheme of this nature, uh, before it gets anywhere near Parliament, one hopes that the uh, components of the scheme have been. Um, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. But I... So here, um, it, it's really just making a point which I uh, may well be repeating myself on. Um, it is a point that's been very carefully considered to use the paradigm of the monthly payment cycle yeah. for all purposes. Yeah. And it, that is distinct from legacy benefit, where payment cycles really were not, in fact, central. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Social Security legacy benefits would be paid on weekly, fortnightly cycles and, and things like that. But the interaction with the employment market and salary was completely different. And, and what about the interaction with the benefit cap? Yes. How was, was that also carefully considered, can you say? Well, um, the, 
in a sense, it speaks for itself, because if one has decided that there's going to be a, a particular paradigm, and if somebody has a payment arrangement which is not within that paradigm, yep. there are going to be consequences for all sorts of aspects of their circumstances in respect of benefit cap and anything else. What the respondents will fairly say is, well, where's the document which puts the two together on the mm. same page and says benefit cap or, and 28-day payment cycle? And uh, I don't say that there is such a, a document. It's not what the submissions of the, for the judge You say it was inherent in the yes. architecture. It's inherent that when one um, decides to adopt a particular structure which does not uh, tessellate with the other payment cycles, that there's going to be all sorts of different problems that arise from those other payment cycles. Uh, and I use the word problems. I don't actually accept that it's a proper description here. It is, it, it is consequences, really, of the decision. Um, and what will arise, certainly, is that there will be people who looked at on an annual basis or looked at on some other basis are basically in the same position but they end up with a different universal credit entitlement. That, that's an obvious consequence of making this sort of decision. So the question is, uh, having done that in pursuit of administrative efficiency, etc., cetera, um, is it rational? Or do we have to then retreat from that and start introducing new systems in order to accommodate with all of these consequences, which were well known? So, um, more references to the debates, um, and paragraph 28 then, the benefit cap. I mean, one sees in the calculation in the legislation, which we'll look at very shortly, that that then uses as well the monthly paradigm itself. So it's the 52 over 12 formula. So it's known that for the purposes of the benefit cap, which is fixed at an annual amount, in fact, its application will apply monthly, because that then fits with the monthly construct that underpins universal credit, and it follows as a matter of inevitability that there will then be situations such as this present situation, in which the benefit cap is applied because the earnings are below the amount. I hopefully don't need to trouble the court with the, the evidence on the calculation of earnings, so that's all directed from paragraph 29 onwards towards the divisional court's judgment in Johnson. What is relevant is the RTI point because the judge placed some significance on some of the evidence about uh, well whether this should be easily addressed. Um, but then just to expand on the evidence very briefly, paragraphs 31 to 32, very familiar to my law because we had basically the same evidence before the court in Johnson. This is about the centrality of using RTI, digital information feeds, in order to found the basis of the universal credit calculation. They are very attractive because they allow for universal credit awards to be calculated automatically. Um, true it is that we are the masters, not the computers. Anything can be uh, ad adapted and changed. That much is accepted. The issue is, is it desirable? And that underpins the judgments which are recorded in the Court of Appeals judgment in Johnson about certain particular situations. There one sees reference to points of Jakob disease and the Manchester Arena bombings and things like that. You can add in these layers of complexity for good reason, but there really does have to be a good reason for it. Then the, the benefit can is addressed then from paragraph 35, um, as it is not in issue in this litigation, some of this evidence is really justifying something which is really common ground. Um, and the, the point that's set out in the evidence is paragraph 39 in particular is the point I've made about the move being simply to earnings received as opposed to hours worked. So I'm really just emphasising the fact that working 16 hours a week is, is neither here nor there when it comes to universal credit. Because one can disapply the benefit cap for working fewer hours at an increased wage. One can, um, you know, one looks to the, the monies received, not the hours worked. So that is the contrast with the previous iteration, which is important. Uh, 
Um, so then the, the benefit earnings threshold in universal credit, so paragraph 47 and 48, this deals with the point about the move towards earnings being the trigger as opposed to anything else. And the witness provides reasons at paragraph 48 as to why that better interacts with universal credit. So based on the monthly assessment paradigm, supports the fundamental principle of universal credit, uses RTI. And in the Secretary of State's view, it allows for greater flexibility. It allows for somebody who may uh, be uh, unwilling, for whatever reason, to work a greater number of hours to seek, if possible, to obtain slightly higher paid employment. Of course, there will be cases, many of them, when someone can't do that because the labour market conditions don't allow it. But this is about promoting behavioural changes. And that is one way in which one can uh, avoid the application of the benefit cap without working an additional uh, amount of time. In paragraph 49, the witness properly recognises that it doesn't work for everybody, but it's not designed to. Not designed to because you have to have bright lines. Absolutely, you have to have bright lines because bright lines are necessary, but also deliver the general benefits. And uh, in any event, that there is the slow behavioural change aspect to all of this as well. I mean, not designed to is perhaps not quite yes. what you mean. It is designed to, so far as possible. Yeah. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. And the re you just acknowledge there'll be some people who can't work the extra hour or persuade the employer to weigh above the NMW or NLW. Yes. Um, they can, but this is... Or, but this is, I suppose, strictly speaking, a different point, uh, persuade the employer to move to monthly payment rather than 28-day well, payment, which well, is actually what's happened in this case, we see from the footnote. Uh, well, here my understanding is that it's different employment. A different employment, sorry, yes. yes. But 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 at the same rate and for the same hours, but paid. Is it sorry, Mr. Drabble, since I've interrupted, the, have I remembered your footnote correctly? Yes, uh, it, whether it's the same it's job. jobs. Sorry, yes. He's changed jobs. Uh, he's getting the same money, but it's a different pay. And for the same and hours. Consequently, she's not capped. Yeah. Uh, she. The, the evidence which I'll take the court to as to why her employer in the first job job that we're actually dealing with yes, in the facts of this case couldn't change. Yes, no, quite. Because she, the employer itself, not quite sure whether it's a him or herself, um, has an income stream herself, which is um, uh, a form I, 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 I understand totally, and in, in a sense it's a red herring for me to mention it now. Um, but is it still caring for grandmother? The present job? No, no. Oh, it's different, completely. I see. But, and we acknowledge that, of course, there will be cases where the, just can't be done. Yeah. Um, but taking that evidence, they say, well, employer won't pay more or um, won't change their cycle or something like that. I don't quite answer the issue about, well, is there another two hours of work available in the marketplace, which would be the Secretary of State's response to all of this, namely that if, if the scheme is designed to encourage even small amounts of additional work, yeah. it doesn't have to be with the same employer, um, you know, people will have additional uh, employment, zero hours of employment, alongside their regular 16 hour per week national living wage um, ongoing employment. So it's, it's that sort of behavioural change which I appreciate may not work for this respondent. I do not quarrel with that at all. May work for others. And the Secretary of State's view is that even promoting small amounts of work is part of the beneficial aspects of the scheme. On the point about changing the payment cycles, um, it is a, you know, a, a, a certainly a point I make with some trepidation because every time I suggest something of this nature, it's like, well, it's not realistic. And I understand that it, probably in most cases, an employee has no bargaining power to change a payment cycle. But some do, you can ask, um, unionised employer uh, but, employment. But that is a separate point, really, isn't it? Uh, it was a red herring for me to introduce it. In terms of the behavioural change, 
um, what you're basically concerned is, is to get people to work a bit more or for a bit more money. Yes, that's certainly... Um, Changing the payment cycle is, is, is not a behavioural change that you're designed. That well, you're, I, uh, the Secretary of State would be content if employers phase that. Well, can, all right, be content. Okay. Yes. But I... I but that's essentially a matter of administrative convenience. It works. It's not an object of the legislation to have everyone paid monthly. Well, if it better assists with it, monthly right? budgeting, okay. then to some extent it is, and the evidence exactly. is that of that. So. And you said at the outset that that was the trend. Yes. The trend was in the direction of monthly. Yes. Payment. So, um, if this reform increases that trend, that is not objectionable. Uh, you presumably say that if you have, that there has to be a coherent, stable structure yes. within it to measure all those parameters and drive the behaviours and the monthly paradigm as you call it is, is that. Absolutely so. So if you have those core paradigms um, and they are small in number and very simple to understand then that will drive behavioural change right around the labour market. If one has diffuse objectives and different ways of dealing with different situations, then it's all reactive to particular situations that are arising in the labour market, rather than actually driving the reform from on top. And this scheme is designed to do that. It's not designed just to respond to every particular situation that arises and then tinker in order to recalculate universal credit amounts. So it is a fundamental way of approaching it, which is expressed in the legislation, which is really quite important to all of this. Um, so I don't need to say anything else about the, the reasons for the shift, the new approach to the benefit cap. The claimant circumstances, um, obviously the claimant's put in her own evidence and we accept it and the particular points are, are clear. It is right that in 11 out of 12 assessment periods the pay received is too low. Um, that does require then either a change in employment, which is what's happened, or working additional hours. That's, uh, as my Lord indicated, that, that would be our short answer to all of this. And I think the suggestion was one and a half hours would yes. make the difference. Indeed. And uh, it just has the misfortune to be right on the on the dividing line between right on the earnings threshold. If I'm using the terminology correctly. Well, um, le le I mean, there's some suggestion that this is a very common pattern. Hmm. People working exactly 16 hours at exactly the minimum wage. I haven't quite understood why that should be more common than many other patterns. Uh, Especially 20 hours, sorry to interrupt, yes. but four, four hours a day. Yes. sounds m much more common than 16 hours a week. Yes, I mean, it is right to know that there is some evidence of a 16-hour divide between part-time and full-time work, and the full-time work starting at 16 hours, and there's some traces of that. Well, can you explain why that would be yeah. so? Maybe we, we'll ask Mr. Drabble about this later, if it still interests us. Or but it's a socio economic issue as opposed to a legal issue. I mean, this is what's happening in the labour market. Well, why 16 rather than... A, a, a multi, I mean, in a way, you'd think uh, one one way you might think is people would work half a day for five days a week, and that would normally, if your half a day was four hours, produce a twenty-hour week, or if your half a day was three hours, it would produce a fifteen-hour week. Mm. Yes, I don't quite see what so uh, sixteen, as it happens, is chosen in the legislation, but I can't see why that should reflect any particular pattern in the labour market. Well, it, it, it does seem to reflect um, some sort of... Well, we will, we, maybe you or Mr. Ravel can take us to the evidence about that. I, that that's going to be difficult. I mean, the, the difficulty here is that we're talking about exhaustive statistical analyses, which certainly sit within my clients' offices. This is what they do. Um, so they analyse labour markets and they understand uh, what the common phenomena are. Um, we're not putting it in evidence because... It, if we start putting everything in... But in a sense, I'm not even sure why it's relevant. It's just, it's just us trying to understand. Yes. Not so much why 16 hours is in the Regulation 82. I think it's there if I got the right one. Yes. No. Yes, well, we, we say it's, it's, it's 
not as such. I mean, what it, it's in there as part of a formula to... Well, right, but why that figure is yes. chosen for the formula... Yes. That, I mean, that's quite interesting too, but I'd like to point out, why should it be a particular pattern that is encountered? My point really is this. Wherever you have a dividing line, you'll have people falling on either side of it. It's perhaps slightly unfortunate if your dividing line is one which corresponds to something that's incredibly common in the labour market, untypically common. But I can't quite see why 16 hours a week should be untypically common. Why should it be more common than 15 hours or 17 hours, or as my lady says, 20 hours? It's just, but, it's just a... But the dividing line isn't the 16 hours. Uh, the dividing line here arises because of the 28-day payment cycle, which is not a, a common occurrence, or at least isn't the paradigm. So we, we don't dispute the fact that this respondent was working for the 16 hours per week, and that if the payment cycle... Had yes, been... but the 28-day thing wouldn't affect her if she was weren't earning if she was working 18 hours. Yes, and if it was a weekly cycle, then... We have got the calculations as to how frequently the, the issues would arise. And, uh, well, the weekly cycle would arise in just the same way, wouldn't it? No, it's different. Um, so yeah, four sorry. weekly, two weekly, and single weekly result in um, different outcomes here. So it would be 10 months out of 12 if on a two weekly payment cycle where one would uh, not hit the minimum. And on a, a weekly cycle, it would be eight times a year. Because that's the issue when one has. How different. odd! What? Uh, well, because one's using different inputs, so it's inevitable as a matter of mathematics that. I'm very you, bad at mathematics, evidently. Well, if, if one's dividing the the year it has 365 days and 12 months, and one if one uses that the 12 months, then it's all very straightforward. So it's if you're paid thing. weekly, yes, you got to. You'll have just the same. But the real problem is that that apart from February. Most years, um, uh, most week, most most uh, months don't have an equal uh, exact number of weeks shown into them. Exactly so. So you have the problem whether you're being paid weekly, fortnightly, or or, uh, or four weekly, won't you? And you have the same problem. No, it's a different problem because oh. one has on, on this situation the the twenty eight day cycle. Uh, see the evidence here. Eleven months out of twelve, one does not uh, hit the minimum. Right. If well, you were being paid weekly, wouldn't it also be 11 months out of 12? No, it would be um, 8 times out of 12. But that's what you're saying. I can't understand why it should be so. I can, well, I can do some calculations, but it's a mathematical. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unfair to you because you weren't expecting this question coming, but it's, it's not an answer to say it's just the mathematics. I need to see how, why it works. It's in the evidence somewhere, a bit of the evidence I obviously haven't read. Is that right? Um, no, it's, it's, it's not because you're, no, you're saying it's self evident, it's obviously self evident to you, it's not self evident to me. I, I Let's been... leave this. My lord, my lady will explain to me over lunch why it's self evident, <laughs> and if they can't, then it's self evident either. And if we think it's sufficiently important, uh, we'll come back to you. What I can do, this is what I did myself, I mean, it is it to some extent. I hadn't anticipated the underlying workings might be required, but the, the, the output is actually on the department's website. They say if you're paid weekly, this is what will happen if you're paid fortnightly. And all I've done is co copy and paste yeah, that in. Well, I, I, okay. Um, my lord has done a uh, visual aid, which uh, assisted him and his assisted us, but we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't share with you. Um, but maybe he can um, adapt it to show that you're right and I'm wrong. The court it actually is interesting. I was, it's all the first document I was going to take your lordship to in reply. It's page 152 of the supplementary bundle. So in the select committee report dealing with this issue. Generosity. As a graphical Can illustration. Check? No, no, I don't. I was going to do the sums, but I'm not sure I've got that. No, well, my lady doesn't yet <laughs> think it's self evident that she's getting there. Um, well, 152. 152, and the table, <clears throat> the Lordship picks up, when my lady picks up what's happening. The pay and benefits capping in each assessment period, total annual earnings of 6,515. That's the vertical type alongside the table and then shows what happens if you're paid 543 monthly one payday per assessment period no cap that's the top one next mm -hmm. one down 543 monthly on the last working day of each month that's, that's Johnson. Johnson that's Johnson then we have our present case 501 four weekly one or two paydays per assessment period mm. capped 11 out of 12 that's the present case 
one down is page 251, fortnightly, two or three paydays per assessment period. This will probably well, make it clear to me. I'm very I slow. I will, I will put my wet towel on my head. And, um, so it's because it must be because the constant is the is the payment. You have a constant, and the days are fluctuating. You have a, const, you have a, a regular mm -hmm. assessment period because it's a calendar month, not a lunar month. To yeah, we got that terminology, yeah. or, or not a, a yeah, that's uh, easy not a fortnight yeah. or a week, um, and the interrelation between the two. Uh, produces the table because some weeks will have some months will have a th have three extra days some will have mm. two extra days so the weekly the seven day I mean it gets out of sync will be out of sync as okay. you go along exactly. the year but you've got I, a I don't pay. pretend to be able to do the maths in my head but I rely on this <laughs> but I rely on I the still table. don't quite get it but my lady will explain to me afterwards yeah. yeah. that, that table does um, I think make it clear with those of us who prefer visualising things uh, it's exactly the same numbers that I've just read out, namely that it happens 11 times out of 12, 28 days, yeah. and, then, and then And the reason is, as my lady sets out, namely that it's the millennial old problem of months not being the right length. Well, uh, well same that's the easy bit, but I, well, I still, uh, I, I'm not going to waste any more time, but what I still haven't quite understood is why that problem creates a different result for people being paid one week, every, every week to every four weeks. But there you are. Well, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure it's me, and I'm not to waste the time to court. I'll get there in the end. Uh, understood. But what we say then is that the logic of the judgment means that you then got to start dealing with all of these. Yes, I see. It's your point is this is the thin end of the wedge, which you say would undermine the whole structure. Yes, absolutely so. And I appreciate those sorts of submissions. One wants to interrogate it, but plainly right here. And indeed, accepted by the judge to be the thin end of the wedge. Um, we've, I think, covered a lot of the legislative material. Uh, what I was proposing to show you, uh, happy just to indicate what the relevant regulations are, but perhaps we will need to just look at the benefit cap provisions. There's tab 14, the authority bundle. We've looked at Regulation 21 in respect of the assessment period being the month. And then Regulation 54, which is at page 228, is the provision that was determined as a matter of interpretation by the Court of Johnson, i.e. no reconciliations and things like that. And it's Regulation 79, page 329. C seventy nine one benefit apply benefit cap applies where the amount in the reference period exceeds the relevant amount. And then seventy nine two the reference period is the assessment period. So the point there is that although the benefit cap is an annual amount, in fact it applies on a monthly basis. So that requires calculation. Well, Lord, have a Not there yet. I mean, I've been. I've uh, I, I obviously have studied all these as reproduced in the yes. in the skeleton. Yeah. Um, so that then is the, the provision that links then the benefit cap to the monthly assessment period. And the regulation 80A. The relevant amount is determined by dividing the applicable annual limit by 12. So that's 80A sub 1 at page 331. So that makes it clear that. It's the annual amount stated in sub power two, and it applies on a monthly basis. So if you happen to find yourself in employment um, just for a month, then it will be applied to that month. And again, that is because the month is the relevant temporal unit here. And the regulation 81 provides for the reduction of universal credit where it exceeds the benefit of the act. And Regulation 82 is the exception to the benefit cap. So the benefit cap not applied <coughs> to people who are in sufficient work. But the work here is measured by reference to income.
And just it's something we touched on, but I made it clear I wasn't at that point interested in asking about, is is there evidence anywhere, and you may say it doesn't matter, as to why these particular number of hours, 16 hours per week, were chosen? The, uh, this is perhaps the, the point that the court was exploring with me before. So what is the, the significance of the 16 hours? Well, it's a slightly different point, but still it is yes. a, a related um, point. And I pledge to try and get back to you on that rather than seeking to do that on the hoof. No, that's fine. It, 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 it's, it's background, but it's just it's made me feel more comfortable I've understood it. It's not, a, I appreciate, um, fundamental to the issues in the case. Yes, we, the, the response would say that it is a... But to, just to be clear, you said it, there are two points. One, why is it the case that apparently 16 hours per week is a particularly common pattern? Two, why is this particular figure chosen in 82-1A? They are separate questions. They are, but to some extent they'll inform each other. Because they may or they may not. There might, there might be several. Up to you, but they have, there is evidence that 20 hours per week is also a particularly common pattern. Why did you choose 16 hours rather yes. than 20 hours? I understand in, entirely the point. And yeah, OK, fine. But I just yeah. didn't want there to be any misunderstanding as to what was interesting me. Um, interesting so in terms both. of regulation 82, then, uh, it is a, a formula, so a mathematical yeah. formula, and it converts oh, yeah. to a financial yeah. amount as opposed to anything else. Yeah. So. The hours is background, it's factual matrix, it's important, but um, Parliament has decided now that you look at money received. Critical here. Um, Johnson, then, is my next port of call, which I can take probably about 15 minutes. Uh, so tab, tab five of this bundle. Will be familiar to the court. It's the non-banking day salary shift problem as described by Lady Justice Rose in paragraph two of the judgment. And in paragraph four, the court accepted the Secretary of State's argument on this point about the universal credit scheme being built upon clear and easily identifiable inputs, which is important. And the court then sets out the legislation. Sorry, which, which four is a long one? Yes. It, it's some. Um, which is the particular yes. sentence you or passage so, you have um, in mind? The submission of Secretary of State is just below D, which is ultimately accepted on this point. The SSWP appeals to this court arguing that the divisional court was wrong. Oh, I see. Sorry, I thought you were saying that they just raised that at this point accepted that. that that's accepted later. Accepted later, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 that's fine. Yep. Yes, the point was accepted, not at this point. This is not the operative. Yeah. Um, so the court deals with the legislation, I think some of the points that the, the court has raised this morning. So the statute is, as I've actually put it, an open textual statute, and that's right, and all of the, the building blocks are contained in the regulations. And the important point, which comes across very clearly, is that one has to consider this at the macro level. Uh, true it is, one can consider, obviously, the circumstances of individual cases, but when one is looking <coughs> at decisions regarding scheme design, one looks at the, the scheme as a whole, not its impact on individual claimants. And we put some authority in our skeleton argument below for that, the cost in the UK, not in the authorities bundle, not controversial. So that's in paragraph 39 of our skeleton below, which is at page 105. Um, if I can race forward then to paragraph 36, then the court sets out the wider context of Regulation 54, but a lot of this is actually the wider context of universal credit architecture more generally. And the court makes the point about earned income in Regulation 52 being deliberately drawn very widely to catch not only remuneration from conventional employment under a contract of service, but pay received for a trade or any other paid work. The cohort of people likely to be claiming universal credit will contain many people whose work is of a casual, sporadic nature, 
and who receive that payment for that work in lump sums or instalments rather than in regular amounts. The general principles set out in Regulation 54 have to apply to all those kinds of work and all those patterns of income. And true, it is the courts referring there perhaps to irregular payments, but the same logic applies to non-paradigm payment cycles. And um, over to paragraph 40, the point which we say is of significance, and the Court of Appeal rightly had it in mind in Johnson, is that automation is relevant here to ascertaining the intention of Parliament. Parliament intended for this to be a simple scheme to administer an automated systems. And as the evidence that I've shown the Court demonstrates, that had at it it's half the monthly payment paradigm. So it is right that factoring in or taking into account other cycles will require then changes to the order that. In paragraph 47, um, the court records then discussion about the wide range of circumstances in which claims receive actual amounts which are different in different assessment periods. Makes a point specific to Johnson about what that means as a matter of interpretation. And uh, the court there records the Secretary of State's case that uh, we accepted that the issue that arose in Johnson arose within the chosen paradigm, which is a factor of some considerable importance. And irrationality, uh, so the test that the Court of Appeal set out is, of course, uh, accepted in common ground. Uh, it is right to note that it is a high threshold. The way that the court put it at paragraph 50 of Johnson is important. So having set out the relevant authorities, the court says, we need to consider what are the disadvantages of deciding not to fine-tune the regulations, thereby allowing the non-banking day salary shift problem to persist unresolved. This isn't a fine-tuning case at all. Antelarisco is not about fine-tuning. This is about the known consequences of a central decision. So one can see that if one is talking about fine-tuning, that really shapes the approach of the court towards the Secretary of State's case. I mean, what, what possible justification can there be for not fine-tuning? On the fact that this case, there was none. In terms of the risk, it's really fundamentally different. consequences. And what's slightly odd about this case is that a lot of these are simply lifted from Johnson and, and, and the judge decides that they apply effectively equally in, in the present case when they are fundamentally different. So Johnson and the, the oscillation issue arises because of the non-banking day shift in a certain number of occasions per year. Here it said, well, we've got the same oscillation problem because one month out of 12, there's a different payment amount from the other 11 months. And that is not properly described as oscillation at all. It's certainly a very different type of oscillation from that which was before the court in Johnson. So there's no real analogy between the Johnson problem and this issue. This is a known outcome. So the important distinction about the interaction with the work allowance and the effect of Johnson is that it effectively, uh, the language used by Johnson was it confiscated part of the work allowance, which is an important part of the universal credit calculation for people in her situation. And accepting that description as we do, that was the outcome of Johnson. Here, it, it, this isn't the case at all. There's no confiscation of something which is otherwise envisaged by the legislation. 
here, it, it is perfectly clear that the, the actual benefit entitlement is correctly calculated. I think it was the case that the, it was a, referred to in Johnson that the non banking day shift from could in certain circumstances also affect the operation of the benefit cap. Yes, that's right. And but that, though it wasn't a case on the facts of Johnson itself. Indeed. And that's recorded in Lady Justice Rose's yes. judgment. It's different. Um, and it is right that it was a factor. Um, but it's a factor that arose in a, in a different way. Uh, so, as the court will recall in Johnson, in, in difficult to predict circumstances, there are a certain number of times per year that the banking day shift triggers these perverse consequences. That's not the situation here. Here it's totally well, predictable. I, I see the point you're making, but it's not quite right. It says not non banking day shift is also perfectly predictable. You just needed to get out a calendar and work out when. When Saturday, Sunday, and bank holidays that rose, obviously you need to know for each case whether that was someone who was paid on the last day of the month. Yes. Um, but once you knew that, you could predict exactly when those people would be affected. Y yes, it's predicted in the sense that one can do that, but it will then be different months every year. Yes. One, no, okay. And the Easter analogy is one given by the court is absolutely right. One can go out forever into the future and work out every single month, but it won't be um, January. March, May, and July of every year. It will move around. Um, so that's the difference, or at least one of the differences. It, it doesn't really matter because this is a different case. Yes. Um, in terms, though, of the specific points, so there's oscillation and the worst allowance. Um, in terms of the legal analysis, though, uh, if one can pick it up from paragraph 68, the way that the court approached it was really to scrutinise the reasons that were being advanced as to why the Secretary of State wasn't responding to something which she accepted would probably be described as a problem, as opposed to simply a, a consequence of the chosen paradigm. And there, it was important that in no sense did the decision not to do anything further the policy of universal credit. So that particular um, point was, uh, was not available to the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State wasn't saying, well, if I don't do that, that will produce behavioural changes, which I think is a good thing. Here, it is very much the Secretary of State's case that choosing the particular paradigm and not allowing for alternatives to it does deliver the behavioural changes that I've discussed with the court, which are set out in the evidence. So you're not quarrelling with the approach. You, it was right to scrutinise the Secretary of State's response, but yes. you say here it's uh, qualitatively different. Absolutely so. Here it stands scrutiny. It didn't in Johnson. That is the fundamental difference. So but here, here it what scrutiny? Here it with, it withstands yes, legal yes. scrutiny. Um, because it is right to note, and the respondents will take you to the fact that Child Poverty Action Group have raised all of this at the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State has fairly said, well, I, I see the point, and I am thinking about that. Yeah. And she is. Um, but that doesn't mean, though, that having uh, agreed to, to, do, to consider it, that the court can then compel her to yeah, do something. It means that she will, she will have to make a policy choice weighing the greater complexity against the adverse effects of the present. Yes, and system, her and that's that's her her choice, not ours. Indeed, and as matters stand, her, her decision is not to induce a, introduce a complexity that would be required. Yes. Um, you just remind me, um, as I never even knew, was uh, was a application for permission to appeal made to the Supreme Court in? Oh. Yeah. And you have in the bundle. If if it's of any relevance, the legislative response to Johnson. So uh, there is a response set out in the legislation as was necessary in order to give the decision maker the power to do what was required. Um, this may be relevant, it may not. My Lord will recall that part of the issue is well, what, what's it going to take to actually do all of this? Yeah. In such a state's case, is that there will have to effectively be a reconciliation process carried out by a, a Department of Work and Pensions decision maker. And that's what happens, and that's what the legislation provides for. But um, here's a, 
things have turned out fine. Um, what is important, though, paragraph 69, is the point I've been making about the monthly assessment period paradigm and the evidence that was before the court in Johnson, which was obviously a similar effect to the evidence before this court, uh, just picking up between D and E, paragraph 69. The evidence lodged by the SSWP makes it clear that the reason why the assessment period was set at a month rather than a week, like many legacy benefits, is because that was already the most common way in which people were paid and not set for growing popularity. And then there was reference to more evidence about all of that. In paragraph 70, the monthly cycle of assessment periods was therefore chosen specifically because very many claims would be paid in the same position as the respondents paid a regular salary and receiving that salary in monthly instalments. It's not right to say that there is no significant connection between the choice of a monthly assessment period cycle and the fact that many claimants are paid their salary monthly. It would not be inconsistent with the overall universal credit scheme to devise an exception to solve this problem. That very much anchors the Johnson problem within the monthly framework paradigm, which is precisely the opposite from the situation before the court here. Bright lines, uh, bright lines to some extent is accepted. In general terms, everyone agrees that bright lines are important, particularly for this important system. However, it's not quite good enough on the facts of Johnson because of the particular nature of the issue. And paragraph 73 has reference to the, the complexities the Secretary of State has consciously decided to introduce. That's where one sees the which like leper disease and the Manchester bombing situation, all of those being, of course, deliberate policy choices, so ad hoc bespoke exceptions to the rule. In paragraph 75, the court makes the point that the scheme designed to simplify and reduce the cost of delivering benefits, there will need to be bright lines, I agree that there will often be hard cases of people falling just on the wrong side of the line, but their needs and circumstances are otherwise indistinguishable from those falling just on the right side. And the example given is of an 18-year-old person. Because it may well be rational to introduce such a requirement on the ground that the benefits outweigh the disadvantages arising from those right lines. In my judgment, those situations are readily distinguishable from the significant predictable but arbitrary effects on the benefit of a regular monthly salary, which frequently falls into different assessment periods because of the non-banking day salary shift. And here, all the respondents can take from that is the, the regular point, which is one of their main points, one of the judges' main points. They say, well, we too are in a regular payment cycle. But that is known. It's, it's the, just the different pay, regular payment cycle from that which is at the heart of this scheme. Well, what's the evidence about whether or not the non-banking day salary shift anomaly was thought about at the time? In Johnson, I, we fairly conceded that that was not uh, really... It was, just, it was just overlooked or not? Well, it, uh, it was one of those things that happen when one introduces a macro benefit scheme. And, um, and it, it's caused, of course, by employers as opposed to necessarily anything that the state in designing the scheme has failed to do. Um, so employers failing to pay monthly pay regularly because they only pay on banking days in certain situations triggers these particular consequences. Now, it is right that because the department has taken to know everything about the labour market, it probably could have worked that out. But it was effectively not a foreseen consequence at all. I think if we went over this earlier, I think my recollection is there was some rather equivocal evidence, yes, um, but uh, certainly it was not at all clear whether or to what extent or what level it had been thought about. There wasn't anything showing clearly that it had been. Yes, indeed. So 
sharp consequences and that they reveal them. And this is why the court properly said, well, we are where we are. Let's look at the desirability of solving it as opposed to there being any process of recrimination about where, how we got here in the first place, because all of the decisions that resulted in the phenomenon were sensible ones. It's just something that then arises as a result of various other logical decisions that have been taken at an earlier date. And what the Secretary of State then has to do, as the court uh, directs, is, well, think about it rationally and decide whether you are going to solve that problem. And the Secretary of State embraces that. It's in the evidence. It's called test and learn. As part of the scheme design. Nobody suggests that the scheme as it stands today will be in place in exactly the same way forever. It will be reformed in order to accommodate changes in the labour market and changes in the economy, etc. That will all be thought through. Um, so it is true that things can be changed. But that doesn't mean they were unlawful before. No, well, weren't unlawful beforehand and not desirable necessarily to change even now, simply because a, a hard case has been brought to the attention of the Secretary of State. So automation is addressed by the Court of Appeal at paragraph 77. And the significant advantages of automation are highlighted over the page at 136. It saves money, and you can recycle that money into paying welfare more generally. court there accepts the point that I made by reference to the evidence about the way that this does then deliver behavioural changes at an individual level, facilitating automation, encourages people themselves to become familiar with online services, they can then obtain cheaper utilities and things like that. One, the court does emphasise, and we say for good reason, that um, it is only concerned with the particular problem before it, and not making an exception for people who are paid at frequencies other than monthly. So the court acknowledged, uh, because it, frankly, Pantelerisco was part of the discussion before the court in Johnson, that there would be other similar types of outcomes in the sense that you'd have two people in otherwise identical purposes, but one particular nuance of their arrangement results in a different universal credit amount. One of the illustrations that we offered to the court was the Pantelerisco case. Um, and the, the court properly emphasised that it is only dealing with a very particular phenomenon. Then a bit for consideration, which I'm not proposing to go over again. Other factors are addressed by the court of paragraph 92. The points about size of the cohort and duration of the impact and arbitrariness. And all of this seems to have been taken by the judge below as being a sort of checklist to apply in any situation. Is it predictable? Yes, it is. And, and that's not what the Court of Appeal was trying to do. The Court of Appeal was simply illustrating all of the factors specific specific to non-banking day shifts, which taken together meant that the Secretary of State's uh, justification stroke rationality arguments did not pass muster. It wasn't intended to be a sort of checklist of matters which one applies to any universal credit case. It wasn't, some wasn't a menu against no. which to, to check the rationality no. of every other scenario. In, indeed so, my Lord. And to some extent, and maybe this is this unfair on the judge. It, it does appear that this approach is a bit of a menu and saying, well, that factor also applies. This is also predictable because it's 28 days, for example. And what's the size of the cohort? And frankly, the evidence about the size of the cohort here is, is not at all clear because there is evidence of 28 day payment cycles being a certain percentage, somewhere between 20 and 30%. I think but, there's something in, Miss, is it Mr. Lee's evidence about numbers? 
Uh, yes, that's right. But that doesn't really answer the point, no. because we're talking about people who are benefit caps yes. as a result of all of that. I so think he does deal with that, doesn't he? Because he deals with... He, he takes a national living wage payment and then multiplies it by the numbers who are earning at or below national living wage, or yes. 16 hours, 17 hours, 18 hours a week. But that, that comes to a, a figure, 72,000. Yes, but um, that doesn't quite... Well, the reason why that doesn't appear to correspond to what the department is seeing is because well, people are just adapting to it and working the additional hours on top. Yes. Yes, yes, but that's, that's, a, that's a fair that's point, that's but it's just never there's a starting point. Yes. Yes. Y yes, that there won't be... You can't work out how many people will be in Ms. Pantelerisco's uh, unique situation where the, co the combination of circumstances means she can't increase her weekly Indeed. hours by one and a half hours a week. Yes, so you can go part of the way and, yes. and see how common 28-day payment cycles are. But, we, but, we but in any event, doesn't the size of the cohort cut different ways? I mean, yes. if, it's, if it's so small, why can't you make an exception? If it's so big, then you must make... Do you know what I mean? It, Absolutely it, so. It's hard to know whether it's... I, I, I like agree. A plus or a minus. It is hard balance. to know if it's a plus or a minus, because if it's just one case, then it's tough. It's a very hard case uh, if nothing is done in response. But um, take this position here. It's not really about the numbers. It's about the fact that it does strike at the heart of the anterior decision, and it is the thin end of the wedge, because once you do it for 28 days, then you've got to do it for 14, then you've got to do it for 7, then you've got to get into Well, even that's a secondary point. The, the real point is that it strikes at the heart yes. of the policy decision taken. Absolutely so. As to the, as to the structure. And that's the heart of your case. I mean, that, in a sentence, that's the case. Yes. The case. Yep. It, it no certainly more, is. No more complicated than that. No more complicated. I, I certainly would say that um, you know, a court can scrutinise anything, of course, but here, if, if one considers how central this aspect is, and the good reasons that underpin all of it, given the high threshold for a rationality challenge as set out in Johnson, is it really capable of being met here? And the answer is no. Johnson was an extraneous factor in the sense that it was a quirk, as yes. you would say, of the banking system. Yes, it was a quirk, precisely so. And this isn't. Brackets, which you should have known about. But... Perhaps. Um, So the, the other factors, these are all secondary points that the respondent will make points about predictability. They will say it disincentivizes work. We don't accept that. Um, somebody, even in this payment cycle, would be better off actually working than not working because they would have the benefit of the income. If they financially, they would be better off. The, the point that the respondents make is that it doesn't incentivize work as much as it would do if you had a, uh, an assessment period cycle which corresponds to the payment cycle such that the benefit cap is... Doesn't it encourage you to work 17 and a half weeks, uh, 17 and a half hours a week rather than 16 if you can? It does, yes. They say, well, it's a bit unfair because we're doing 16 and somebody on the monthly cycle is doing 16 and they're not subject to the benefit cap. But it, it does have that fairly um, robust behavioural uh, effect. Um, my Lord's judgment makes the point which I've made quite a few times, which if I can respectfully adopt it, uh, as set out in my Lord, Lord Justice Underhill's judgment at paragraph 113 on page 145. We do adopt that. It, it is extraordinarily complex. does involve a range of practical and political assessments. It does have to be workable. It does need to incorporate bright line rules and criteria. And it will not discriminate fully between the circumstances of different individuals. It will do so at a level which is appropriately broad brush. And the court makes the point again, which we respectfully adopt, the court should avoid the temptation to find that some particular feature of such a system is irrational merely because it produces hard 
even very hard results in some individual cases. But, but we, we do say this isn't, isn't actually a particularly hard case. This isn't Johnson where the individuals are trapped in a circumstance not of their own making and which they can do nothing about. That's a factual position before the court in Johnson. But there was no sensible way in which the respondents there could address the non-banking day shift because they can't withdraw their universal credit claim because of other provisions in the legislation. Uh, they can't work more. None of those factors can, can mitigate or reverse the consequence of the legislation upon them. Here, they, they can. Well, in an individual case, we said they can't. Ms. Pantelarisco may well be an example because none of the parameters are under their control. They can't work more. They can't get the employer to pay more. Well, it's the thing that she has, though. She's moved employment. Well, all right. But it's a different kind of can't. Yes. Um, perhaps that's a too oblique way of putting it. but I... It is. Um, because on one view, the, the Johnson respondents could also move employment. And yeah, the Johnson respect. respondents basically, this is a, a hit they take being in their current job. Um, simply, as I say, by, by, by the, the, the quirk how, of the banking system. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you move employment to avoid the quirk of the banking system? Do you need to have a monthly payment that's in the middle of the month? Yes. Um, so one of the points that I had made is that um, some employers do run two payrolls, for example. Right. And in those circumstances, it, it only actually depends on when your payroll is being yes. administered. Yes. So, um, if you're, but if you're paid on the 15th of yes. each month, you'd probably avoid all the bank holidays. Uh, yes, it's not just bank holidays. You need to basically be um, paid on the 1st of the month and have your assessment period running from the 15th of the month. Right. And then there is no question of the issue ever arising. Right. The issue arises when the, you present your universal credit claim and start your assessment period on the same day, roughly, as the salary payment, so the last first day of the month. And then the bank holidays start shifting it around. Oh, I see. So running two payrolls solves that, but... Um, but not all employers do. Never did. Um, it was uh, probably just anecdotal. I think a debating point that was able to be made there was the revenue. In fact, at one point, simply told employers who paid on a, a uh, Friday to report having paid on the Saturday, on the actual... Oh, the other credit, way around. Or the other way around. Yeah. Oh, sorry, to pay... Yeah. Uh, so that in the in the returns to the universal credit, it would show up as being paid in the month, in the in the in the quote right month rather yes. than the accidentally wrong month. Yeah, I mean that it doesn't look as though that's the route it's been taken, or maybe it has, but it can be done anyway. Well, um, that solves the problem for those who do it. So yeah. the legislative solution deals with the truculent employers who don't change their systems, and then it, it is the responsibility of the department. If you become an RTI employer, that can be told to be one of the things you're told to do as part of the RTI scheme, but not everyone is an RTI employer. Yes, that's right, and also yeah. some get it wrong, but there are other provisions anyway. But yeah. Okay, let's not go there. But. Um, so my Lord then deals mm. with the point 114 and 116. This is very much about the particular issue. Um, and just taking what my Lord said below uh, B on 146, that I of course understand it's a fundamental principle that entitlement should be based on monthly receipts. However, much of can may vary from month to month. Sorry, where are you reading from? Sorry, uh, just below B on page uh, 146. Yes, I see. Uh, an adjustment specifically to address the non-banking day salary problem would not in any real sense undermine that principle. Indeed, it could be said to vindicate it. And my Lord explains the reasons for that. And there's an interesting paragraph in the judgment below, which I'll come on to, where the judge seems to conclude himself that actually it would be an improvement to the system if one were to build in 28-day payment cycles as well, which we say is a difficult conclusion to understand. But here it's absolutely explicable on the evidence in Johnson. My Lord, my Lord is right. Um, if one addresses all of this and one's really ironing out something which is a, uh, or an issue which is at the heart of universal credit to everybody's benefit, it's fine tuning basically. And my Lord, Lord said at 116, 
this judgment does not go any further. Where is that effect? critique then, or identify what we say are the errors in the judgment. So, Pat, uh, uh, Pat 10. Paragraph 2 of the judgment on page 68. Read literally seems to suggest that the Johnson case came out of the blue and slightly odd because it was very much at the heart of the submissions before the court in Pantelerisco, but probably doesn't make any particular difference. Um, certainly, though, the challenge below was ground one, Johnson Divisional Court, ground two, irrationality, ground three, discrimination, and ground two is the basis of, in which the claimants succeeded. Um, but if I can just skip over all of the legislation and the evidence on the basis that I've already taken the court to it, and just focus then on the, the conclusions from paragraph 51. The heading is the disadvantages of allowing the lunar month problem to persist unresolved. It is a small point, but I don't accept the description of this as being a problem as such. But nothing really turns on that. We say this is properly described as a, a, a consequence. A phenomenon. Yes, my lord. So paragraph 52 then, so the claimant is in continuous and regular employment, which of course is, is right. But it doesn't really grapple with the fact that if one is considering this at the level of the cohort, not just the individual case, then the continuous and regular employment and regular amounts of money could really extend to anything at all. I've given the examples then of the weekly and fortnightly payments, the seasonal payments, term time, etc. So having a, a simple paradigm such as this, the Pantelerisco paradigm, doesn't really deal with the So um, the, the court simply just explains, we say, the, the consequences of the 28-day payment cycle. Then paragraph 53, legislative policy is to encourage work. So the court accedes then to the respondent's submission on that point. But we say, well, clearly this particular aspect is focused on the efficiency components of the policy justification. That isn't the only legislative policy. That is one of them, and a very important one. But the evidence is perfectly clear that there are many, and that they will be in competition and tension with each other. So this particular point needs to be considered by reference to the overall efficiency and also the behavioural changes about monthly budgeting. In any event, we do stand by the point my lady raised with me to some extent, this does in any incentivise working an additional one to two hours per week. Then, paragraph 54, the first claim is household income fluctuates dramatically once a year. Difficult interpretation of the word dramatically there. This does happen once a year, and I accept that it is a, a significant change, but it is a regular amount of 11 months of the year, and a different amount on the 12th month. It is a completely different form of oscillation. It'll still cause considerable hardship to a family like Miss Pantley. My lady, absolutely so. So the, the point here is that it is in the 11 months when the, the difference between the earnings and the benefit cap exemption is, is really quite modest. Yes. And if nothing is done about that, then the benefit cap applies, and that has very significant consequences. And it really comes back to, well, what's the answer? Yeah. Because the answer in the individual cases tends to be to simply sort that out, work the additional hours. 
Uh, can I just get this clear in my head? For the 11 months, the problem is that the benefit cap applies and therefore you earn much less than you would have done if it didn't. Yes. Not earn, receive. Receive. Yes. receive. Understand that. In the 12th month, clearly the benefit cap doesn't apply. Um, and you receive uh, double the sorry, the benefit. Yeah, the benefit. So you you receive. Well, double the earnings. From the well, you receive double the earnings, day. but that's in a sense not the problem. No. You're, that that's not a fluctuation. That's just what you're always used to. It's twenty eight days. Yes. So far as benefit is concerned, what's the consequence on your benefit? You receive a much larger payment of benefit in that year. In that month. You receive a large payment, but then there's the issue about the work allowance, which. Yes, well, that's what I was getting to. So you don't actually, I mean, you this wouldn't make up for the other 11 months anyway, obviously, by definition, doesn't it? No. Um, getting the cap lifted for the 12th month wouldn't make up no. for, the, for the other 11. But it doesn't even, I mean, there is a problem also in that month as well, which is that you're earning so much that it impacts on the work allowance. It, it can do in certain cases. Yes. Not everyone is entitled to a work allowance. That depends. Yes, I see. But it impacts here. She yes. she yes. will receive less than she would have done in that twelfth month as yes. a result of but, double but earnings. If one annualises it, it would have the two consequences that my lord has just outlined. So no benefit cap, and you'd have the full amount after work allowance. Yes. As well. So so, but this is in a. Uh, is, uh, it, 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 this is another aspect of the phenomenon, but it's a very minor one compared to the... I mean, the real complaint is about what happens in the other 11 months. Absolutely. The, the real complaint here, and I don't in any sense look to minimise um, no. any particular financial consequence. It will all be significant. But the, the, the gravamen of the challenge here is the benefit cap and the consequence in the 11 of the 12 months. That's the central part of the response. And the only reason why it's worth spelling it out is partly for my own clarity of thinking, but also the judge seems slightly in power 54 to treat this much more like Johnson as yes. being the real problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, whereas it, but it's um, the norm here is the 11 months, as it yeah. were. That's the, the, the situation that generally uh, arises with this particular payment cycle. Um, so that's not fluctuating, um, difficult to see what the budgetary point is. In, in truth, it is really the general injustice of there being a lower payment in 11 months that one would have as against somebody paid monthly. It, you say injustice, but it's the hardship of not having the, the amount of benefit that somebody who's paid monthly doing exactly the same hours with the same number of children would, would receive. Arbitrariness is another word you might say. Yes. Well, Arbitrary save that, that suggests that it's not, in fact, the subject of some deliberate decision. Yeah, it's, an, it's apparently arbitrary, but you say it's not really arbitrary because it is a consequence of the statutory scheme, and there's always going to be a bright line somewhere, and, and unfortunately on these exact situation, you, you fall just on the wrong side of it. You yes. could call that arbitrary, but only in the sense that any bright line is arbitrary. I see so. Um, Paragraph 55, the effect of the regulation is to produce different levels of cap depending on the payment's pay date and payment cycle chosen by the employer. Precisely so. I mean, that's said by the judge, though, to be a reason why the Secretary of State needs to do something. But that, that, that is well known to the Secretary of State. Different levels of cap depending on payment cycle. It's not really pay date in this case, it's payment cycle. The pay date is the same every 28 days. Um, then rejected my point there about it, try and sort it out yourself, that's fine. Um, but here, uh, taking them from the, the individual case, individual evidence, uh, the claimant says, well, local authorities said it's not possible. And that, well, that, that's the, the claimant's situation. So that particular response to the phenomenon is not open to her. It doesn't mean that there's no response or that at a macro level, for the population generally, um, there will not be the sorts of shifts that are envisaged. So true it is on an individual case, the employee may and probably will lack the bargaining power, I don't say otherwise, but it's not really the point that's being made here.
And then paragraph 57 is where I respectfully say the judge does appear to have treated Johnson as a bit of a menu for what one needed to show, rather than actually analysing the specific case before the court. Um, so, I mean, the, the disadvantages are fundamentally quite different from the position before Johnson. And here, then, the court deals with paragraph 59 with the point about it regularly. Um, and the judge says, well, this is even more clear because uh, it's obviously regular because every 28 days, but in a sense that doesn't really deal with it because we know that it's a regular payment cycle. But as I said previously, it's, it's the, the different regular payment cycle from the, the monthly paradigm that's at the heart of all of this. So the fact that it's regular tells you nothing at all. And then paragraph 1661 rec records the court's detailed and nuanced analysis in Johnson. They see paragraph 60 and 61. And then some of it says in paragraph 62, in my judgment, the same significant particular arbitrary effects are found here. But why? In what sense is there a proper read over from Johnson to the present case? What the judge seems to be saying is, well, I, I consider this to be a problem. Don't see any good reason or sufficiently good reason why you don't just fix it. Then 63 automation. Uh, so 65, the court said, having considered the points about automation, on the evidence of the present case, it's plain that some, at least, of the necessary computer software is in place and can readily be utilised. I didn't actually show the court the evidence. Uh, happy to do so. But the, what the judge has in mind here is the, the, the post-hearing evidence that was filed by the parties at his invitation about what's in the RTI feeds. And the evidence demonstrates that there is a field, field 54, which allows uh, the employer to record the fact that it's a 28-day payment cycle. In response to that, Ms. Crowhead's second witness statement says, well, that's fine as far as it goes, but that doesn't tell you whether this is permanent, continuous employment, or whether that's just how the payment's been received in a particular month. If you have, for example, a claimant who receives a payment for, say, six hours' work at a national living wage, or at a higher amount, for example, and the field reports that that's part of a 28-day payment cycle, what does that actually tell you in terms of what you do with that information? So the fact that it is possible to identify that it's a particular payment cycle isn't really telling you enough in terms of um, doing something about it. The, the respondent's case seems to be that um, where you just infer that insofar as anybody is receiving a, an amount of money which appears to be 16 hours per week in a 28-day payment cycle, you assume that that's their permanent position and it's going to be like that for every assessment, assessment period, such that you can do a, a notional annualisation calculation and disapply the benefit gap. But it's simply not a safe assumption. And that's what the department's evidence says. Then, would a solution be consistent or inconsistent with the nature of the universal credit regime? And uh, the judge does say at paragraph 67, one important, important element of the UC regime was to align the assessment period with monthly payment and charging cycles. And at 68, what does, does he mean? what does he mean by charging? Um, I think he means bill payments. So, uh, oh. outgoings. Yes, outgoings. So the judge says, 68, I accept that accommodating a four-weekly salary cycle would not advance the behavioural change of encouraging people to plan their working lives around a monthly working payment pattern, and that is a consideration in favour of the Secretary of State's present stance. But first, the weight to be attached to that consideration is somewhat reduced by the evidence discussed at 64 or above, to the effect that the data needed to manage four weekly payments is already collected by HMRC. I don't frankly follow that 
reasoning. So the fact that it is known that it's on a four weekly salary doesn't tell you anything about the behavioral change of managing your affairs monthly. And second, that is not the only behavioral change in prospect. And then the, the judge appears to accept the, the, um, the case of the respondent that uh, doing a four week was well, better than nothing in a sense that uh, if you're going to um, resolve this problem, then at least do it in a way which provides some sort of benefits for individuals such as Ms. Pantelerisco. But it's simply the wrong approach. You need to look at it at a much higher level than that. And we say it does facilitate work. Um, and paragraph 69 is extremely difficult. The judge says, I accept that introducing a solution to the lunar month problem would make the UC process technically more complicated, although for the reasons discussed, it seems to be unlikely to be unmanageable. Furthermore, in my view, such a solution would make UC conceptually much simpler. So in the first half of the paragraph, we're being told that it's more difficult. And in the second half, it's, the judge appears to be saying it's more simpler, albeit he says conceptually more simpler, whatever that means. Well, we say the first half is right. It's more difficult. And the second half is wrong. It's not more simple. In any event, the, the, um, the second part of 69, respectfully, does not, we say, show the, the appropriate level of judicial deference for a case such as this, because the judge really is saying how he thinks the universal credit scheme would be better designed. And with the greatest respect, that's not a matter for him. Paragraph 71, we say, was not really a, a, a cogent basis for rejecting the very clear evidence from the department that this is certainly not something that can be the subject of a, a, a quick fix or a fine-tuning solution. So we do say, and the way we put it in the grounds of appeal, is that this is simply a misunderstanding of the evidence. And the, the other points about, well, was it properly considered? And we don't need to say anything more about that. Um, in 75, the size of the cohort, again, covered that in my submissions already. It will affect certain people, quite what the size of the cohort actually is, is rather unclear. And simply identifying how common 28-day payment cycles are doesn't answer that. And duration of the impact, uh, well, we, we don't agree that there is no way for the respondents to respond to this, as it were. So it is different from Johnson in that respect. In Cleveland, we don't agree that it's arbitrary. Uh, 79 through to 81, the very clear evidence that I've shown the court should have been accepted, namely that uh, this requires careful consideration. And this isn't just a point about programming IT systems. This is a, it has to take place at a policy level as well. And so the, the, the conclusion of the court at the top of page 88, that the difficulty substantially disappeared when the further evidence was obtained. That's just simply wrong. The evidence is perfectly clear that simply identifying a payment cycle is not going to be sufficient to resolve this. So the court reaches a conclusion that um, it's irrational. The court 
properly directs itself to Johnson and identifies that Johnson did appear or does appear on its face to be certainly in the first instance directed to the phenomenon, true it is that the points of principle are of application in any other case. Um, but it's difficult, we say, impossible to take from Johnson any further read over into other phenomena other than the fact that if they truly are irrational in the sense that's described by Johnson, then of course they'll be unlawful. That's as far as Johnson goes in terms of a crossover into Pantello Risco. Um, but we do say that the, the passages that I've shown the court from Johnson do appear to make it clear that it is the fact that the problem arises within the chosen paradigm that is of crucial significance and once one departs from that, then really the analogy with Johnson simply falls away. So it is an objectionable extension of Johnson that was put by the court. Um, I've given some notes in response then to my Lord's question, but I can deal with them later or try and do it on the Sorry, not really read them. Well, it's entirely up to you. If, you. if you haven't read them, you might want to just mention them at 2 o'clock. Yes. Uh, or, I can or, or, I mean, entirely up to you. If you think you can digest them quickly, let's have them now. No, I'm probably <laughs> too ambitious. I'll, I'll, I'll read them and then uh, perhaps just deal with it as part of the reply. Whatever suits. If they're purely factual questions, there might be something to be said for dealing with them as it were at two o'clock. Yes. Because then, in the event that Mr. Travel has something to say about them, he can say something about them. Yeah, well, I'm certainly content to do that if the court wants to. Don't really see how it works out. Uh, one more order. Subject to any further points, those are our submissions. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Brown. Very helpful. Yes, Mr. Rubble. Well, can I start? with two preliminary issues, or description of two preliminary issues, which have come out of the exchanges between the court and my learned friend in the last few quarters of an hour or so, or they've probably part of the theme all the way through. Uh, the first is that the case, um, as summarised by my learned friend shortly, a short while ago, is that the problem in the case is the, is, is the result of a, of a consciously adopted central feature of the universal credit scheme, namely the monthly nature of the assessment of received income. And secondly, he says that the result of this Pantelisco of individual circumstances is the result of the application of an acceptable right line. We don't accept either of those. In particular, whilst we do accept, and we spell this out in some detail in the skeleton, the fact that the monthly basis for the assessment of universal credit is that adopted in the regulation, was considered, put like that, the monthly basis of the assessment for the purposes of the fundamental means test was considered and was deliberately adopted. There was no consideration at all of the implications of that, what my learned friend describes as the paradigm, the application of that paradigm to the particular issue of the benefits cap. And that's the central problem in the case. The adoption of the monthly received income basis for the benefits cap, as opposed to more generally for the universal it was not the result of a conscious decision. I'll, I'll take your Does it statement. matter whether it's a conscious yes. decision? Because uh, the, the well, learned friend's case is that this court should hesitate, or should not, interfere with a central policy decision of the Secretary of State. Yes, but it's not. I obviously see the force of that at a sort of psychological constitutional basis if you see that the democratically elected person has actually grappled with this very problem and come up with a solution there are important considerations of constitutional deference mm -hmm. but if he or she has adopted a policy with all those um, and 
thought about it a lot, but has failed to focus on one particular consequence, adverse consequence of it. Does that make, does the fact they haven't thought about it really ultimately make a legal difference? We've got to look at the objective justifiability yes. Objective rationality of so the I state of affairs, which has which has which has uh, um, I, resulted. I accept a lot of that. The size of the consequence that they haven't thought about, which is what I, which is my bright line point, the second part of this these initial remarks, the size of the consequence that's been omitted from consideration, does affect mm -hmm. the court's appraisal of rationality. If I can just kind of jump ahead to the size of the bright line. My other friend has not said what the financial impact, the overall financial impact on the misprint of this state of this world are. We, if your lordship and my lady go to our skeleton, is it four hundred and fifty pounds a month? We do know it's four hundred and fifty yes. pounds a month. It's five thousand a year, therefore. Yes, yeah. yes, it's a huge it's amount. Huge. It's a huge amount. And so, if I, I, I'll, I'll come to this. If your lordship and my lady go to the table, I took your. The court, well, I, I, I pointed out to the court, and of course, my own friend's admission is rather rude, but um, the table which is in the select committee report, session page 152. Feature of the scheme that has resulted is that if you look at that table, so sorry, I'm slightly behind you because I was just writing a note. Where have we got? Where have we gone to? I was asking the court to look at page one five two of the supplementary bundle uh, in the table. Oh, the same table we went to before. Indeed. Yeah. 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 And what what my learned friend's submissions come down to? Proposition the application of the monthly paradigm to the exception for the benefit class means that there is full payment of universal credit uncapped for line one of the table. And payment of 5,000 odd pounds a year less to line three. Solely because of a difference in pay cycles. That's the proposition. Now, against that, it does matter whether the Secretary of State has produced a rationale for it. If he hasn't thought about it, she's sorry. But there is a rationale. The rationale is it falls on the wrong side of the line. But that's not a rationale, because he's well, got to justify the line. Uh, well, wherever the line comes, there will always be a uh, winner and a loser, someone who's close to it. No, there's, there's a, in our case, if you look at the purpose of the benefit cap, I'll take your lordships and my lady to the speech, I think it's of Lord Wilson in DA and DF, spells out with some care what the purpose of the benefits cap is and why, therefore, the exception for those who are working is a central part of the architecture. So you have line one, of the table, someone who is working in a way which the architecture of the benefits cap itself expects, i.e. 16 hours a week. I know the Lord has a lot of questions about where that figure comes from, which I'll try and answer to some extent. But it's not a random number of hours. So you have somebody who is respecting the architecture of the benefits cap and the exception to it by working 16 hours a week and producing the result that is line one of the Table. You have someone in, who is in otherwise identical circumstances, same pay, same hours of work, but is paid on a different pay cycle. That's the sole difference between the two situations. And that produces a 5,000 a year differential in a basic poverty avoidance means tested benefit. 
that's not just a bright line. That's a sledgehammer. Uh, to use the proportionality analogy. Why, why on earth should the difference in pay cycle generate a difference in treatment of that kind? If it was an inevitable consequence, is the adoption of a monthly period of assessment that even if not thought about, your Lordship might be entirely correct in putting to me that it doesn't matter whether the Secretary of State thought about it or not. It's plainly not an inevitable consequence of the adoption of a monthly assessment period for the basic for the basic means test, not an inevitable consequence of the adoption of a monthly period for the adoption of the basic means test, that the benefits cap exception is described in the way in which it is described. It's perfectly possible, obviously, for the benefits cap exception to be drafted differently. No thought at all went into how it should be drafted, as, we, as I will demonstrate. So the, the design of an exception, which is a central feature of the benefits cap, without any thought, is producing a £5,000 differential between line one and line three. We say the judge was entirely right to say that that difference of treatment between pay cycle monthly and pay cycle four weekly furthers no discernible objective of the universal credit. Indeed, it gets in the way because it produces such an arbitrary distinction as to, produce, as to bring the benefit into can, the can, can I? While I accept it's not an inevitable consequence, isn't it a natural consequence of assessing benefit on the basis of a calendar monthly assessment yeah. that you assess the uh, impact of the benefit cap likewise? No. I, I, why? I, the, 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 the targets are distinct. The benefit cap if you uh, well, could I take your lordship to the passage in the but before we but before we do that and what it, it what follows inevitably from the logic of the maths is that there will be an impact a different impact of the benefit cap yes. in the and therefore what my lord is putting to you and I think the way mr brown put it it's inherent in choosing a monthly assessment period that there will be an impact no, on the only, benefit cap. only if the monthly assessment is carried over to the description of the exception to the benefit cap. Well, it, it, it was. Well, I know it was, but no but, one, knew, but, no one well, knew it was going to have this impact. Well, but it was but, inevitable. That's, it was inherent in no. the, ch the choice of monthly assessment. I, I simply don't accept that. It's oh. a, um, the t we're, we're talking about two different targets, aren't we? What we're talking about one is the assessment of income for the purposes of a basic means test for universal credit. Our skeleton accepts, and I'll go and make this submission in more detail after lunch, that it was perfectly sensible for the Secretary of State to adopt a money received on a monthly basis, basis, I'm repeating the word basis, to adopt a money received on a monthly basis for the means test. That has the inevitable consequence that there will be swings and roundabouts. So that if you end up with less money in one year, sorry, in one assessment mm -hmm. period, I don't mean year at all, I mean assessment period, you are likely to end up with more money in another assessment period. The oddity of both the banking shift day well, there won't normally be swings and roundabouts. It depends on the on the regularity of your. Well, it depends on how long the arrangement lasts. I completely agree with that. But assuming that nothing cuts nothing cuts across the pattern of employment, the means test there will be swings and roundabouts in the basic means test. And there obviously won't if you change jobs or the payments are, are irregular or whatever, in which case the, uh, it's obviously even more sensible for the Secretary of State to adopt a monthly basis. The problem with the benefits cap is that the cap cuts across the 
swings and roundabouts. You don't get the swings and roundabouts, which is precisely why you have the difference between line one and line three. It's the product of the fact that the cap intervenes to prevent the ordinary application of universal credit assessment rules on to a four weekly pay cycle. Apart from so the, the cap, cap intervenes to, to prevent what would be the natural result of the application of the four weekly of uh, the application of the normal universal credit assessment period to the four weekly pay cycle, which would be swings and roundabouts, if you're going on employment over time. So by preventing, I don't know, I never know whether the good thing is to swing on the roundabout. Never understood the metaphor of swings and roundabouts. But preventing the upside. It's the fluctuations, isn't it? It cuts across the fluctuations. There are no fluctuations because you because the cap forces yes. you down yes. to lose in 11 months without ever being compensated. Now, I simply do not accept that that effect, which was not appreciated by the Secretary of State until CPAG pointed it out, we'll go back to the detail of, of that in a bit. Um, I don't accept that that effect, which was not appreciated by the Secretary of State, is in any sense a natural consequence of the adoption of a, of a monthly assessment. If your lordships and my lady look with care at the material that the Secretary of State has put in to justify his description of the monthly basis of assessment as being the paradigm situation, it all relates to the basic underlying means test. None of it relates to the application of that without more to the benefits cap or to the in our exemption from the benefits cap. You would have needed a benefit cap that fluctuated in accordance with the fluctuations. Well, yes, exactly. Yes. But the fact that there wasn't one, the fact that there was a fixed yes. benefit cap, me meant it was inevitable, didn't it? Uh, this only was inevitable the consequence. If you didn't do anything about it, and that's the complaint. <laughs> that is the complaint. It does mean it's inevitable. I mean, if your leadership is putting to me, as if the Secretary, not having thought about it, then wakes up to realise that he's got a disparity between the monthly assessment of income for the purpose of the basic means test and the way in which the benefit cap works, then you're really quite right. That is inevitable, but that's the complaint. It's yeah. leaving that untouched. So as to produce a £5,000 a year differential between line one and line three, which is the complaint. And it is not right to say that that result is a deliberate result of the architecture of, the, of, of universal credit. It simply wasn't thought about. Yeah, well, I mean, I am uneasy, as you can tell, with this whole question of who thought about what, because you never get to the bottom of it anyway. Yeah, well, I, 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 com I completely understand that. But I can just say this, this last point, which I'm quite keen to say. We have had a series of submissions from the Secretary of State about decisions to incentivise patent changes of behaviour and so on. Your Lordship will look through all the submissions to the ministers and the parliamentary debates in vain for any reference at all to the desirability of changing pay patterns or anything of that sort. It simply doesn't feature. Um, so this one is left with a learned friend pending on the way in which he characterises the scheme, which is it produces a series of incentives to change pay cycles and so on, which doesn't feature in any parliamentary debate. Doesn't well, to be fair, I think that was very much an afterthought that he made that point, oh. rather than when, possibly even when invited to by the court, or certainly in response to an observation by the court. Well, I'm not sure about that. But it, it, it doesn't, uh, at that point, I can say it doesn't matter, <laughs> and do say it doesn't matter. What does matter is that the disparity between line one and line three <coughs> is produced by something as arbitrary as the difference between pay cycles. And as on the face of it, no justification in terms of the fundamental architecture of universal credit.
Mm. That's what the judge, that's where the judge got to, is that if a conclusion, well, if I've looked at all the positive reasons why you should keep this differential in place, none of them stack up. So I'm just left with the objections to the difficulty. Yes, yeah, it's like something to talk about after um, lunch. It's going to be quite what the limits of the rationality approach to this sort of legislation are. It can't be enough for you to say this is badly designed because it failed to spot a problem which has quite a serious effect, admittedly on not a huge group, but nevertheless a significant group of people, um, which not all of them will be able to do anything about. Uh, bad uh, secondary legislation which has that sort of impact isn't axiomatically unlawful and this is still a very different kind of situation from that uh, which uh, the court believed entitled it to intervene in Johnson that you needn't respond to that but I think I, I don't think it's enough to say yeah. which the Secretary of State I'm not to put words into Mr. Brown's mouth, but acknowledge is maybe the case. This is a respect in which it, perhaps the scheme could be better designed. She said she'll look at it. She hasn't said she'll learning about it, but she said she'll look at it. And you're always going to get the primary, secondary legislation uh, of this complex nature, which produces yeah. um, suboptimal outcomes for some groups, which can perhaps be adjusted. But that doesn't mean that, that, that it's irrational. You're going to have to tell us how we can tell the one from the other. Yes, and the, the answer is going to be what I think I've already submitted, which is that the basic means test is aimed at one target, namely the, the assessment of income. In my head, applicable amounts less resources, but that's an old income support calculation, but it's universal to the same thing. And on the other hand, the objective of the benefits cap, as discernible from the primary legislation which governs it, um, and the decisions of the Supreme Court in BN and GF, and the failure, the, the rationality is the failure to marry the two, which produces yep. this sort of extreme result. That's the submission. Right. Well, you can develop that at um, two o'clock. All rise.